This is Eric Maisel, and you're listening to the Inspiration Place podcast with Miriam Schulman. This episode is sponsored by the Six Figure Artist, an art business coaching division of the Inspiration Place. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello, this is your host, artist Miriam Shulman, and you're listening to episode number four. 42 of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so thrilled that you're here. Today, I've invited a therapist turned creativity coach because managing anxiety is something that every creative person needs to do. So in this episode, you'll discover lies we tell ourselves that actually mask our anxiety, why procrastination is an anxiety state, and why creative people need to learn to deal with anxiety rather than avoid or deny it. But before we get there, I wanted to tell you about today's freebie. One of the anxiety management techniques that we're going to talk about today includes affirmations. So I've gathered up a brand new list of 10 affirmations to decrease creative anxiety for you to use in your meditation practice, or you could put these in your art journal. To get your hands on this, you're going to go to shulmanart.com forward slash 42. All right, now back to our show. Today's guest is the author of more than 50 books and a noted thought leader in the movement known as critical psychology. Some of his books include Unleashing the Artist Within, Van Gogh Blues, and Mastering Creative Anxiety. He writes the Rethinking Mental Health blog for Psychology Today. He's a sought-after keynote speaker and facilitates writing workshops from around the world. Please welcome to the Inspiration Place, Eric Maisel. Hello, Eric. Welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for coming here. I've been a long-time reader of your column in Professional Artist Magazine, which we have to give a little... I guess, prayer of goodbye to, right? That appears to be the case. Yes. Yes. That was a magazine that was around for 30 years. And yeah, I was reading it since the very beginning, but I was definitely a fan of your column. And I also just finished reading Mastering Your Creative Anxiety, which is filled with gems. So thank you so much for coming here to talk to me so that my listeners can get this some of this value from you. You're very welcome. All right. So you ready to get to it? Sure. All right. But before we get there, I have to ask you, what is critical psychology? Critical psychology is a movement. It actually has three names. Sometimes it's called critical psychiatry and sometimes it's called anti-psychiatry. And it's a movement that believes that our current way of diagnosing and treating mental disorders is not only flawed, but actually fraudulent, that the Bible upon which these diagnoses is made, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, is just a shopping catalog and not an actual diagnostic manual. Hmm. There's a lot of energy around this. And for me, what's most important has to do with the way children are receiving diagnoses for things like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder and childhood bipolar when those things don't exist, when those are labels for behaviors and experiences that ought not to be put together in some pseudo-medical way when nothing medical is going on. So that's a provocative headline to a big subject. I've done many books on this subject, including Humane Helping and the Future of Mental Health and many others. So if folks are interested in this subject, I think the place to go, the best place to go is a website, not my website, a website called madinamerica.com, which is run by a fellow named Robert Whitaker and is probably the best critical psychology site on the planet. We'll make sure to include a link to that. And we're actually going to have a link to your, probably your whole author page on Amazon, because like I said, Eric has written over 50, over 50 books. Yeah. And 
doesn't seem like you're stopping soon. No, I've so. got five books coming out in the next two years, so I'm oh, keeping busy. That's great. And you're definitely setting the example for people to keep writing and keep creating. So one of my favorite techniques that you talk about in the book have to do with the cognitive work. And it's not that I don't like the other techniques. It's just that these techniques are more new to me. So I, I'm more familiar with the affirmations and the breath work to quell your anxiety. And I'm newer to managing my mind, monitoring my thoughts and replacing thoughts that don't serve me with more affirmative thoughts. So Eric, what are some of the lies that people tell themselves that could be masking anxiety? Well, let's step back an inch. Folks tend to think about thoughts as true or false, and they kind of understand that they shouldn't be thinking false thoughts, but they're less clear on the idea that they shouldn't be thinking true thoughts either if those true thoughts aren't serving them. So let's say you're a working artist and you decide to do your Chelsea tour and you go into a variety of galleries and you say to yourself, wow, there are a lot of artists out there. That's a true statement, which however doesn't serve you. And what may happen three days from now is you stop going to your own studio and you stop painting. And you don't even know why. And the why is that you had this true thought. There are a lot of artists out there, a thought that you didn't know to dispute. So it's really important to stop thinking about the truth or falsity of thoughts, and, and more importantly, to think about whether a given thought serves you. And a lot of the thoughts that don't serve us are tricky thoughts, and they are among the ones that you were alluding to. They are thoughts like, I'm very tired, or I'm very busy. Those are the two most characteristic thoughts we say to ourselves nowadays to avoid our work. It works because there's a grain of truth or lots of grains of truth to those two statements. We do get tired and we are busy. We have to know to append a big but, a big B-U-T to those two statements and say, yeah, I'm tired, but I can muster an hour of work or yeah, I'm busy, but I can carve out an hour of work. We have to dispute the way we say things to ourselves that are intended to prevent us from working. One artist shared with me recently, which has absolutely helped me so even though I'm, I'm a professional artist, because I do things like this podcast and I have a blog and social media, et cetera, et cetera, there's lots of days where maybe I feel I don't have the time to get to my art. And so she said to me that if you can't find 15 minutes, 15 minutes to spend on your art, then it is an excuse. Like maybe you don't have all day, maybe you don't have the whole afternoon, The way I say that often in workshops is don't scorn small increments of time. Yes. That's exactly what you just said. Now, for visual artists, that's tricky because many visual artists don't feel like they can get set up in 15 minutes and all of that. And that's true. So for writers, that's a different story. You sit there and you have 15 minutes you can write. For a visual artist, that may be different. So I suggest to visual artists that they actually create a menu of things that can be done in 15 minutes. Yes. And that may be making a sketch of the person sitting across from you or, or working on some copy for your website or making a some marketing or promoting decision that only takes a minute to make. If you don't have that menu, it may be hard to make any use of those 15 minutes. So I think there's a pre-step to not scorning small increments of time, and that's understanding what you're going to do with those small increments. I like that. Yeah, because you may not have time to set up an oil painting but you could do a drawing in a sketchbook. could do some of your business work, which is important to keep mentioning because an artist has to prove the exception in order to make it. The rule is visual artists, artists in every discipline are not going to make it. That's a statistical matter. It has to do with the nature of supply and demand in the marketplace. So I want all of my clients to prove the exception. You want all of your listeners to prove the exception. Mm. And they will prove the exception by working on their marketing Every day, at least a little bit, I ask my clients to do three things in the service of their art business every day. That's my, so to speak, demand on them that they take their art business as seriously as they take their art making. Yeah, you know, one thing I also liked about your book was there was a chapter about the anxiety of marketing and the anxiety of promoting 
which I actually didn't think I had that problem because I, I promote my online art classes relentlessly. But the truth is that I hadn't sent out an email for my art for sale in almost three months. So that was a little kick in the butt. And then what made me feel even worse is when I finally did send out the email yesterday, I got a sale. Could have had that sale last month. That's right. Or five sales, you know, if I had been sending it out every week. So it's funny how like the getting the sale actually, I think, made me feel worse than the not getting the sale, because if I didn't get a sale, I could have been right. Like, see, that was a waste of time. But because I actually succeeded, it made me feel worse. And what you're saying, you know, it points to an interesting point, And that is clients will often say to me, well, I'm not anxious because I spend my hundred million dollar budget at work without blinking. I do all sorts of things without blinking. They don't make me anxious. And I'll say, yeah, but does that seem to still pertain to your art making or your art selling? Do you do that as fluidly or as as fluently? Say no. The anxiety manifests most where it matters to us the most. Nothing's at stake for their own identity. Nothing's at stake with that $100 million budget. Who cares? It's somebody else's money. Let me spend it. Let me spend a billion dollars. I don't care. But send out my sonnet that might get criticized. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. That's too hard. Yeah. Maybe I had no problem posting a picture on social media. I had no problem teaching people. I know it's, but then asking for the sale was a different, you know, new level, new devil. That was a different level. And it's not that I'd never asked for sales in the past, but for some reason I had fallen into a what does it matter anxiety state. I push clients to do even more than what we're saying. So it's already hard and provokes anxiety to meet the marketplace. But I ask them to do a bit more, and that is when something good happens to ask for more yet, to not even be satisfied that the good thing happened. If a gallery says, I'll take two of your paintings, I advise my clients to hit reply and say, what about a whole show? Mm. If I'm going to be in a group show, I'll tell them to hit reply and I want my own show. Or may I have, can I have, what do you think about my own show? In other words, once somebody's on your side, there are so few advocates in the world for our work. Once somebody has demonstrated they're on our side, whether it's a collector, or some writer who wants to write about you, or a gallery owner, or whomever it might be, once they've put forward that they're on your side, you want to make sure to ask more of them. Ask them if their friends can be on your side too. Because one advocate, as wonderful as that is, is probably not yet a career, doesn't make for a career. We have to do an awful lot to sustain our career over decades and decades. And as the consumer of many things, we've experienced this ourselves. Like when you're going to check out at Land's End or J. Crew, there's like, oh, you like that shirt? Do you want these pants that go with it? We have to not look down our noses at selling. No, where you're doing a service to people by providing them something that they would make them happy. And it's it's rather difficult for most people to ask for what they want. It's actually rather difficult for most people to speak. You may know <laughs> that public speaking is the number one phobia in the world, more than crossing bridges or flying or spiders or snakes. It's hard for people to speak, especially about themselves and about their work. So that's already anxiety provoking when you connect that with speaking about things that might provoke criticism or pushback or feedback of any sort, that makes it really clear why it's so hard for lots of working artists to put themselves out there. What you're saying right now is giving me an idea. That's probably why it's so hard for me to write the descriptions of the art on my website. I, it's not that I have a problem writing. No. And I don't have a problem public speaking. I wouldn't be doing this podcast, but describing my art does give me a lot of anxiety. Yeah, I've worked with artists who they may take a year to write their artist statement and they're never happy with it. And I think part of that is that words can't do justice or make sense of the art. It's actually an absurd task. And that's why many artists find it so difficult because it is kind of an absurd task to try to put words to what an abstract painting is doing or intending to do. But nevertheless, we have to deal with that kind of absurdity and say, this is my job. I'm someone able to use words. I'm going to use my rhetorical skills to write something powerful here. Yes, it's an absurd task. And yes, the words don't really capture what I'm trying to do with red here. But nevertheless, I'm going to find the words to say something 
that's going to speak to another person and incline them to be interested in me. I like that. Another chapter in the book that really got my attention, second chapter, the anxiety of mattering and not mattering. And that was something I hadn't really thought about. It was kind of the idea of what's the point of what I'm doing? What does it even matter? And I hadn't thought of that being really a problem until I saw it in the words. And I was like, underlying, I was like, yes. Oh, no. Did I give you a problem you hadn't had? <laughs> right. You know, it's like, like in the Jewish holidays, when you go through the whole list of sins, it's like, oh, wait, yeah, I did that one too. Yeah, it's a big deal one. Actually, it may be the biggest deal issue that creative folks face. We're all postmodern enough to wonder if we do matter or, or if we're just excited matter that the universe was able to make. We all understand that kind of possibility that we don't matter in some cosmic sense. And so we have to decide if what we do matters to us. We have to make our own life purpose choice decisions. And it's actually harder to make a life purpose choice decision around putting another image out there than it is to being a doctor or this or that, where the sort of the social quotient of it is, is more obvious. We have to make that kind of decision and we have to stand by it day in and day out. If we don't, we're facing a certain kind of meaning crisis all the time. I wrote a lot about this in a book called The Van Gogh Blues about sort of this background coloration of depression around not really believing that one's efforts matter. And we have to put on that mantle of meaning maker every day. We have to say, mm -hmm. I'm making my meaning. That's a shift from seeking meaning. There's nothing to look for in the universe. We have to decide that we are the meaning maker. We have to decide that not only are we going to identify our own life purposes, we're going to live them. And we have to decide each day that what we're doing matters, at least to us. Now, is that what you mean by existential decisiveness? It is. It's the same idea. It's the idea that we stand up tall for ourselves and for our decisions in the face of a certain absurdity about anything mattering. It's easy to take the other side. It's easy to be ironic and take the other side and say, you know, let me be as crass as the next whatever. Let me just do that. That works much better than trying to make a beautiful painting to move someone. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it was a 19th century dictum, the idea of truth, beauty, and goodness, which sounds so old-fashioned now. And yet, I think it's still what we're all after. And we have to stand on the side of those angels, the truth, beauty, and goodness angels. A word like truth has gotten so deconstructed over the last 100 mm -hmm. years, it's hard to know what it could possibly mean which is why that phrase, truth, beauty, and goodness, sounds so old-fashioned. And yet, there's something about us, something about it, and something about us that still matters. That's wonderful. Yeah, I do think beauty matters, and I hope that's something that my audience agrees with. By the way, if you're enjoying the strategies that I'm talking about on today's show, my specialty is actually coaching other artists to take their talent and create a thriving business out of it. There are a lot of things you have to know, and I don't want you spinning because you don't know what to do next. If you want to profit from your passion or want a clear strategy to ramp up your existing creative business, I would love to help you. To schedule a free discovery call, all you have to do is tell me a little bit about your business when you sign up at shulmanart.com forward slash B-I-Z. Can't wait to hear from you. Speaking of the truth, there was somewhere in your book where I was like, oh, he means fake news. It was <laughs> like, there was a chapter. So this, I actually got the, phys I don't like Kindle. I like physical copies because I like to write in it and take notes. It was basically where we make false meanings out of things that happen to us. Do you know what I'm talking about? So I don't have to find I'm it. I'm not sure I do. I, we often misinterpret information coming in out of anxiety. It's out of anxiety that we misinterpret it. For instance, let's say we get a very cordial rejection from a gallery that says, I really enjoyed your work. I don't have a place for it right now. It's not exactly what we put on our walls, but it was really lovely receiving it. Most artists are going to take that as real criticism and take it painfully, whereas it's actually an opening and an opportunity. I would hit reply, the me who is speaking to you would hit reply and say, thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you liking my work. 
do you know of some galleries that might be interested? And I wonder if you'd make a recommendation to them since you liked it so much, and since it's not exactly right for your walls, which walls is it right for, et cetera? I would never take that as criticism. I would take that as opportunity. But most artists, out of anxiety, would tend to take that as criticism. Yeah, I like the way you take it at face value and then push it a little further. I think also what I was thinking of in terms of the fake news is how we tend to take things and invent stories around it. So one thing that's definitely in your book is the anxiety of waiting. So we might be waiting to hear back from the gallery. So we invent a story in our mind that, oh, they, they're not interested. Every day they're hating my work even more. Yeah. The fact is you sent in your, your whatever and you haven't gotten a reply. Everything else is a story in your mind. That's exactly right. Every working artist has to figure out what he or she wants to say while waiting, say internally while waiting. The best thing, of course, is to keep working and to ignore the waiting, to not be aware of the waiting, to have nice scheduling software or what have you so that you know to check back in with that gallery in three weeks or what have you, but to not be thinking about it. It's an indulgence to be thinking about what that gallery is doing with our work right now. It's an indulgence because it's a way that we get ourselves off our own mark and find ways to stop doing our own work. Mm. But it's not just that it's anxiety provoking or that it's not a thing to do. It's actual self-sabotage and it's actual indulgence to be wondering about, to be curious about what they might be doing invisibly over there. The other self-indulgent emotions are things like self-pity. You know, there's some emotions I feel that are positive and even anxiety can be positive if you are recognizing it and not trying to cover it up, we go to that place of feeling because it's comfortable for us. That's right. And we have to, all the things we're talking about is a certain maturity. We're talking about becoming a mature working artist who doesn't self-sabotage, who has figured out what to do with his or her appetites and doesn't indulge in addictions. There are lots of indulgences available to us to deal with our meaning shortfalls and the difficulties of keeping meaning afloat. We have to be aware of that, that it's easier to turn on the TV, it's easier to shoot up, it's easier to do this or that than our work. It's easier, our work is hard. We're a smiley face culture that wants to make believe that things are easy, things are not easy, maintaining a career is not easy, and so we have to be equal to this work. The analogy I use sometimes is in the the days before D-Day, We don't care what Eisenhower is feeling or thinking or anything. We just want him to get the invasion right. And if he's feeling a little anxious or a little self-pitying that he has to send paratroopers to their death or what have you, none of that is relevant to what's important to us all, which is getting the invasion right. And we don't tend to think of our own work in those terms as as important as a D-Day invasion. Mm we kind of have to. In order to stay motivated, we have to, to use loose language, make believe. I wanted to give its own like segment to procrastination because you talk about that as being like an anxiety state. Can we spend some time on that? Because that's something that really plagues a lot of my art students. They procrastinate and it's not because they're telling themselves they're too busy but they can't seem to figure out why they're putting off doing something that they actually enjoy doing. Let's chat for a second about why all these anxieties arise, just for a second. One reason is that the creative act is one choice after another. Put the red here, put the blue there, one choice after another, and choosing provokes anxiety. The Mm. very act of choosing provokes anxiety. That means that anxiety is going to thread through the creative process. Another reason that anxiety is provoked is that only a percentage of our work works. And it takes a lot of maturity to accept that truth, that not everything we do is going to be anything we want to save. If you think about our Nobel Prize winning Bob Dylan's trillion songs, how many are wonderful? 14, 72, not a billion of them. Beethoven, anybody you want to name, only a percentage of what they do is great. It takes a lot of maturity to accept that for ourselves. And it makes us anxious to think that the thing we're working on isn't going to turn out Then there's the part of going into the genuine unknown, to actually go into some darkness. That doesn't feel so comfortable. We could name lots of reasons why anxiety attends to the process. Well, 
what's the number one thing folks do to deal with the experience of anxiety? They flee the encounter. Mm. That's the number one thing we do when we have the prospect or the specter of anxiety coming, we flee the encounter. That's all procrastination is, is the specter of anxiety looming up and us fleeing the encounter and doing anything else instead. If we could say to ourselves that the simple sentence, I'm anxious, I'd rather be doing X than my work, I'd rather be doing X, Y, Z than my work, I'd rather be doing anything than my work, but I understand it's anxiety. I'm going to employ one of my anxiety management techniques, and there are a zillion of them in the book. I'm going to apply one of my anxiety management techniques, and I'm going to engage in this encounter rather than flee this encounter. I know I'm anxious and I'm showing up anyway. I love that. And one of the things about your book that took me a while to understand. So when I first picked up your book and I invited you to come join me on the podcast, I really wanted to title the podcast Overcoming Your Creative Anxiety. And it wasn't until I read the book that I understood why the title needed to be mastering rather than overcoming because as creative people that anxiety is just not going to go away you have to be a partner with it and learn to control it and recognize it and deal with it but right it's not going away among many there's one reason why that's the case and that is you don't want to repeat yourself for the sake of reducing your experience of anxiety Let's say you're great at doing a certain kind of stripe painting, and now you can do that stripe painting till the end of time, to the end of days. You really would like to do something new. You'd like to break out, but this stripe painting doesn't make you anxious. Mm. So it's important that we have the freedom to do new work. So even if we've figured out how to get rid of the experience of anxiety by reproducing things, by re redoing things over and over again, that's not a good idea. Mm. We will have, in that sense, overcome anxiety but in the effort to overcome it, we will have reduced our freedom. We want to grow, and growth means new anxiety because we're going to be trying things we haven't tried before, maybe things that are more difficult than we tried before, maybe whole new genres, whole new disciplines. I've had clients who have successful painting careers and suddenly want to start sculpture at 62 or something, and they know what's going to happen. They have to be a beginner. They have to make a huge mess. And they're smart enough, mature enough, or just understand this process well enough to accept that they're not, they may be a great painter, they're going to be a miserable sculptor for a while. And do you find that breaking into a new medium like sculpting, does that help their painting evolve? Not necessarily. It's really a separate thing. It's that desire in us to do new things, to not bore ourselves, to make new meaning. It may be that when they come back to the painting, they're, so to speak, not as good. Maybe they've lost some chops. Mm. That's not what's important. What's right. important is that they did something that their intuition around what new meaning ought to be told them to do. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine a world if Monet had decided he was only going to do haystacks and never painted water lilies. Think of a Matisse with arthritis. You could throw in the towel or you could make cutouts. That's even even better example because there he moved to a different medium. And I do know artists who are very successful with a certain genre. I don't want to describe it too carefully because then some people might know who I'm talking about. But I know that they struggle with this. Like, well, I wanted to create different art, but this is my brand now. It's like I, I was working with someone. She only did dog sculptures. And it was very important whether the dog's mouth was open or closed. I forget which was, <laughs> which was more saleable. I can't remember. Right. But she was stuck doing dog sculptures with their mouths open or shut, I forget which, till the end of time, mm -hmm. because they were well-loved and profitable. It's a trap. <laughs> the world provides us with many traps, and that's one of them. Yes. Eric, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I've really enjoyed myself, and I know this is going to be a very well-loved episode. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we call this episode complete? Just maybe a practical thing, and that is I try to sell all clients on the idea of a morning creativity practice. If a person is stuck not doing their work, I think there are three big reasons for it to be in the morning, first thing when you wake up rather than any other time of the day. One is the obvious one that you get a lot of work done. Another is that you get to make use of your sleep thinking, your brain thinks during the night. 
and that's actually a very useful part of the creative process. But most importantly, it allows you to build some meaning capital for the day. If you do something meaningful first thing each day, then the rest of the day can be half meaningless and you're less likely to get depressed. So I think there are a lot of good reasons for everybody listening to institute a morning creativity practice. Okay, let's do it. Art before breakfast. Art before breakfast. Yes. Eric is the author of over 50 books. So we are going to link to the ones we talked about today in the show notes as well as his author page. And we want to make sure that there is a link to your website, Eric. I know that you also run writing workshops. Is there a writing workshop on the horizon? Mendocino, California, great art community in August. I'm doing a deep writing workshop at the Mendocino Art Center in August. And then I'm doing a deep writing workshop in Vancouver, British Columbia in September. So those would be the next two coming up. You know, most of my community is artists, but I know I also have multi-passionate creative people who follow me who might be listening. And I'm also curious, what happens in a writing workshop besides locking them in a room and telling them to write? That's what I imagine. Like, it's, it's like, okay, just do it. It is essentially just do it. But I have lots of lessons that are useful. So typically, it's me presenting a lesson and then folks writing for 30 or 45 minutes. So it is essentially locking them in the room. But the experience of writing alone together is actually very powerful. People love it. And the lessons are important. So that's what the writing workshop is. is it, and people often get in the week, quarter of a book done. They write in ways they never would at home. And they take the lessons home with them and continue writing. So it's a good thing. That's great. It's like a push on the swing and then they get their momentum going. That's beautiful. Like Eric mentioned, he does coach artists. Do you still take on clients? You still have room in your schedule for that? I do. Want to work for you? I only do it uh, via Skype and phone these days. No longer have an office, but absolutely. I still work with individuals. Okay. So all those things are going to be linked in the show notes. Thank you once again, Eric, for joining us. And don't forget, besides checking out Eric's site, you can grab today's freebie. I put together 10 affirmations to help you decrease your creative anxiety. You can find the show notes at shulmanart.com forward slash 42. Finally, to wrap this all up, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my podcast. Coming up, I'm chatting with an expert in blogging and emails, as well as with a lawyer who will share what to do to prevent copycats and freeloaders. I know you're not going to want to miss either of those. By the way, if you're feeling extra loving, I'd love a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you drop your Instagram handle into the review, I'll be sure to give you a shout out on my Instagram stories. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being with me here today. I will see you same time, same place next week. Make it a good one. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. Once again, this episode was sponsored by The Six Figure Artist. If you're interested in hearing how you can earn more for your passion with concrete marketing and business strategies that work, head on over to shulmanart.com forward slash biz. That's shulmanart.com forward slash B-I-Z.